Hey everybody, episode 85 of the Rotter Talk Soup Podcast is brought to you by Atlantis Rising Monstrosities, which is available for pre-order right now. And I just gotta say, folks, ever since Atlantis Rising got its really lavish deluxe reprint a few years ago, it is one of the prettiest games on the market with gorgeous art by Vincent Dutre. But it's even more well-known for its hugely popular gameplay. This is that Rarest of Beasts, a cooperative worker placement game. And um, this game is so rich and atmospheric because it is players working desperately, racing against the clock to save as many Atlanteans as possible before the entire island of Atlantis sinks below the waves, which it will do. Players are doing worker placement, gathering resources, trying to create a way for everyone to get to safety before it's all gone. And... Um, you know, the game is brilliant. I did a uh, rundown of it a few years ago, and this new expansion takes it to even greater lengths. I mean, it's got this new concept of allies, workers that you have to earn by doing little side quests along the way that are all mythological based, really, really neat. New playable characters, of course, magic items you can get that really make you more powerful, different ways to adjust the difficulty. But what's most important, I think, folks, with this is the monstrosities itself. Uh, Medusa is one of them. And what is really interesting to me is, as a worker placement game, uh, when you play at lower player counts, it's always important for developers to find ways to kind of tighten the board up and uh, make it a little bit more tension-filled for players. And you know, so concepts like Medusa, literally freezing your workers, uh, turning them to stone so they're blocking spaces on the board, or deploying its own frozen statues is such a really, really cool idea. And I would love to see it in action. Um, and you know, so... Uh, you know, something that can actually make the game work even better for lower player counts is definitely of interest to me. But, you know, the core game was always really, really great, trying to build up the strength of your characters with special powers. And apparently, this new version has gotten another revamped, uh, upgraded set of components that are really, really nice. I believe there's like a big box deluxe collection of all the previous content that's come out. But what's most importantly, the expansion, uh, the monstrosities, adds the five new playable characters. Characters, the uh, new uh, take on the solo mode, which is very, very cool. Um, you know, all the new meeples for the monsters that you're fighting and for the allies who will fight alongside you. And again, there's deluxe versions of all of this. It looks really, really great. And again, it's been around for over a decade. People have always really, really dug this game. And um, so this is now the best it has ever been with the richest, deepest game play that I would certainly like to give a go if I get a chance. And I mention all this because it is available for pre-order right now. You can go to atlantis.rotto.com. That will take you directly to the pre-order page if you want to give it a go. And uh, that's it, folks. That is Atlantis Rises Monstrosities. And uh, now... Let's get on to the podcast itself. We're going to be a little bit shorter than usual this month because we didn't quite get as many questions to questions at rotto.com. The email inbox is always waiting, folks. So if um, anything that Jen and I are going to talk about today really uh, sparks an idea, definitely send it along. Questions at questionsrod.com. Got no show without you folks and uh, without this month, uh, Landis Rising Monstrosity. So without any further ado, let's get to the show. First, I'll be doing a whole bunch of game-related stuff. Then Jen will join me for a few more game questions, and then we'll do some personal Q&A as well. So hang on, everybody. We'll be right back. Okay, everybody. You had questions. I've got answers. It is time to go through all of your game-related queries that you have sent in to questions at rotto.com. Starting with Dave. These are in alphabetical order, by the way. In my final thoughts on Fire and Stone, uh, D Dave noted that I talked about a BGG complaint about randomness. I argued that the problem that some players of the game reported on BoardGameGeek was primarily as a result of players strategizing incorrectly and was not really an issue with the design of that game. So that got Dave thinking, are there any games that I've seen over the years that I think are truly underrated, not because they failed to garner attention, but because the majority of players didn't understand how to properly engage? I'm sure, yeah, that happens all the time. One of the things that drives me absolutely bananas, B-A-N-A-N-A-S, bananas, is publisher's reticence to actually help the player 
out with notes, hints from the designer, a section in the back, basic strategy tips. <clears throat> because, I mean, publishers don't want to do it because of this old school attitude of no, players have to discover the game for themselves. We don't want to spoil any of the intricate um, journey of, 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 uh, of discovery they can go on. But what will often happen, publishers, when you do this is players will think, oh, well, this is a piece of garbage because they don't appreciate those subtle depths you've put in there. And then they'll play half a game and say, meh, pass, walk away. And that's on you, publishers. And um, yeah, I've seen it happen a lot. Let's let's bring up the browser and let's go to ranked.raw.com, which is my, you know, it's, it's my collection sorted by how I rank games. Let me just go on ahead and look at these. Let me make them bigger. Uh, right off the bat, Shadowrun Crossfire is a... Uh, poster child for this. I, every time I talk about Shadowrun Crossfire, which is a very, very cool, cooperative, um, brutal, absolutely brutal deck building game, uh, it's widely known as one of the hardest to beat co-op games in the market. <clears throat> you know, maybe even more so than Ghost Stories for old timers. Um, and the thing is, <clears throat> Jen and I, we win 50% of the time, but that's because we have learned those subtle stra strategic T strategies, strategic strategies that you need to win because the game really bucks standard gameplay tropes. To win at this game, you have to kind of unlearn everything you've learned about playing a cooperative combat game and come at things from a new angle. I actually even did a strategy. I've done strategy guide videos on this. Um, I talked about this recently in the R&R. &R, and because the publishers didn't give their player base uh, any of that leg up, like warning them about, hey, healing is a trap. Don't go healing. Um, velocity is everything. I mean, there's, you know, you're more often better not attacking the monsters in front of you, but the monsters in front of your teammates. There are so many things that just fly in the face of just what you know, just what you have come to understand is the typical way to play a game that it makes people believe Shadowrun Crossfire is impossible to beat. And it's not. The developers of Shadowrun Crossfire, who of course know all the strategies, they literally win 80 to 90% of the time. And so that means it's skill, it's not luck. But Shadowrun Crossfire hugely suffered for this. One of the best co-op games of the last decade kind of curled up and died because everybody thought it was impossible to beat because the publisher said, oh, let's keep secret all those winning strategies. And, you know, it became a self-fulfilling uh, prophecy. So, I mean, that's a really good example. There's probably other ones as well. You know what I should be looking at is times... Okay, I'm going to go to a different place on Board Game Geek, aren't I? I'm going to go into my profile, and then I'm going to go into my stats, and then I'm going to go into largest discrep dispar disparity in rating. Things that I rate high that Board Game... You know, and look here, Shadowrun Crossfire is a game that the Board Game Geek rates a 6.5, and I rate a 9.8. And I believe... It has nothing to do with the quality of the game, and it comes, it's from this problem that Dave has identified. Um, Guild of Merchant Explorers is brand new, so that one doesn't count. But we gotta look at older ones. Let's see, older games that have been around a while. I mean, geez, Pelepines, I think, is amazing, but it gets a 6.4. Does that suffer from that, though? Pelepines is a genuinely crushing game that requires perfect play. You can, in Pelepines, really accidentally ruin yourself with a, with a one or two bad choices and the game is over for you and it's round two. So, and it's another game that, you know, there's no warning about that. There's no warning about, hey, when you're bidding on a tile, here's the things you need to bear in mind. Because if you bid wrong, you will destroy yourself and just go deeper and deeper down a hole. And I'm not, I'm not saying that. I mean, Pelopines had a very, very small print run from a very small independent developer. I mean, it has found an audience over the years, but still, it ranks, um, you know, b below the average. I mean, a good game on Board Game Geek is high sixes, low sevens, because of the way... I mean, that, that's when you have a really solid game. And so Board Game Geek rates Pelopines down. Is it because... I mean, I've seen Tom Vassell complain about how the game is too harsh and unforgiving. Is it just personal preference? Maybe. Is it um, because the game didn't do a good enough job preparing its players? Could be. 
uh, if I were writing the rule book for Pelopides, you better believe I would have at the back of the rule book, hey, here's some strategy tips. If you'd like to discover these for yourself, don't read. If you'd like to go on that voyage of discovery. But if you want to do well in your first game and not be demoralized, read these things. They will save you a lot of heartache. So publishers need to do this more. And I, I'm constantly baffled when they don't. But anyway, so there's a couple, Dave. Um, but there's a lot. It is not at all an uncommon thing. <clears throat> then, let's move on to Donna, who was wondering, is my merch, Rotto merch, still available? Haven't heard me mention it for a while, says Donna. That's true. I do have merch. Actually, I have two different online merch t-shirt and other things stores set up now. Um, one is Teespring, and the other one is... Oh, I can't remember now. The one I'd set up earlier. I don't remember what they are. I mean, these are, uh, you know, things where major brands just say, hey, give us some bitmaps you can have. Um, so I'd set them up a long time ago. I set another one up more recently. I have to admit, I'm just... I, 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 I feel bad about saying, where, buy my stuff! Wear my picture or my logo on your chest or on your backpack or whatever. I always feel a little silly trying to push it. So it's there. Like, if you're watching this live on Twitch, scroll down. There's a link for the merch store. And also, I mean, I don't really make a big deal out of this. If you, subscri if, if you subscribe on Twitch or if you um, back the show on Patreon or now, if you're a member on YouTube, I just turned that on the other day. I haven't actually told anybody, but you can now become a member on YouTube. One of the benefits you get is 20% off all the merch. You just have to contact me. I will give you a special code that will give you 20% off anything you want. Um... I really need to revamp it. The fact that I've got two separate merch stores that look completely different, I have to co coalesce all that into one. I do have to make a bigger deal of the fact that you can get 20% off. And I've just... I'm always a bit hesitant to go on into full salesman mode, you know? Uh, but it is out there. Alrighty, anyway though, Donna continues. In January, Donna wanted to buy a shirt. And when you got to checkout, or looking at my checkout, uh, there was a message to the effect of, the store would feel free to share info with other entities. That's not good at all. Donna, if you hear this, please let me know. I, I will look into this myself. Like I said, I've got two different stores. I don't like that. That is not cool. Did you have an option to opt out? I'm assuming you didn't. Anyway, though, so uh, you went on and bought a Thinker Themer t-shirt several months prior, and you think from the same web store, uh, as have I. You'll notice I'm rocking um, Thinker Themer for Pride Month. Uh, plus, they are the newest contributor to the channel, and they're just the most awesome people in the universe. Amy and Maggie are great. Uh, but anyway, so apparently Donna agrees because she bought a Thinker Themer shirt. Didn't notice that message, but for weeks afterwards got junk and spam mails. And that's interesting. I did not. I, I bought this shirt myself, and um, I don't remember getting any kind of uptick. But maybe, I mean, I do get spam already. I mean, heck, I wouldn't be surprised if I got spammed just because I created these stores. Who knows? Anyway, though, that's why you didn't go through the purchase of the Rotto shirt. Anyway, I'd still like to get a Rotto shirt, but we reserve the right to sell, share your email with other entities for the purpose of solicitation. Gives you pause, and it should. Donna, all I can say at this point is thank you for bringing this up. Tell you what, Donna, you watch um, somewhere the podcast or listen to it. When you hear this, could you... Um, make a note to yourself to ask about, send another question to questions at Rado.com saying, hey, Rado, did you look into this? And because I am now giving myself a task, I need to get, I need to get my merch house in order in time for your next question next month, Donna, when you say, hey, do you have a place that won't sell my info? Because yeah, that is not cool. I definitely need to look into that. Again, thank you, Donna, for bringing it to my attention. Okay. Ben, um, that Ben comes before D. Oh, but I think, uh, yes, I know. I remember Ben's full name. And uh, yes, so, all right. I don't even have to focus on the alphabeticalness. It doesn't matter. Let's continue with Ben. Ben was super excited to see that games.rado.com is back. Yes, it is. Thank you so very much. Um, Gerald, not Gerard. <laughs> <laughs> um, I believe I got that right. Uh, thank you very much for banker of designer of banker of the gods. Folks, if you don't know what Ben is talking about, let me show you. Uh, you can go to games.rado.com anytime you want on any browser, and that will take you to a breakdown of all of my collection sorted by my rankings. So if you ever want to know what my number, what my number, oh, I went too far. Scroll back up. 
Well, my number 350, uh, the Great Heartland Hauling Company is number 353 in my personal collection. Oh, and by the way, if you want to know more about it, click this little button right here and you can watch my run through. That's the real purpose of this. This is actually a list of pretty much every game that I have covered in some form or the other, all 1,500 of them, I guess. Um, but... Uh, it's sorted by how I've ranked them. So at the top of the list, you get my videos, but you also get my rankings. And Or you can click on the name and go directly to the game in question if you'd like to know more about it. So, yes, game's back. Although, Ben, did you know that while um, this was being made, another one was being made. I'm going to announce it for the first time ever. If you go to top .rado.com, you go to the same list in a different format where it's broken down by year. Here's my top games of 2022. Here's my top games of 2020. Same thing, um, and it's just awesome. It's very, very cool. And if you scroll all the way to the bottom, Here's how the last decade or so ranks. Currently, the you know, based on my top 10 games of the year, 2019 is the greatest game ever for board games based on the rankings I gave to my the 10 best games of 2019. And 2020 is the next best. 2016 after that. Uh, now, 2022, this year, is lagging because, of course, I've only played a dozen games, and the best is yet to come. So you can expect at top.rado.com to watch 2022 climb. Will it climb to the top? Will it be 2021? Who knows? But this is just fun. Top.rado.com. I am so happy with it. Uh, thank you again. Uh, I'm pretty sure it was Jer uh, Jer Gerald. I'm pretty sure it was Gerald, not Gerard. Uh, but again, more importantly, if you want to say thanks to the person who made all this available... Just go to Banker of Gods, um, you know, which is a game that he is developing. Uh, I've been watching it for years, and um, you know, try to learn a little bit more about it. Um, you know, find out more. Uh, you know, get notified of its upcoming Kickstarter launch. Give him a little love because uh, he did all this work for free. Because my games.rado.com site went down, he stepped up, did the coding, had to learn how to wrangle the BGG database to uh, its knees, and then he went above and beyond by creating top.rado.com and all kinds of... It's fantastic. Anyway, though, I'm sorry. That is getting way off topic. Anyway, so Ben was looking while listening to the r, &R podcast and uh, went looking for Polyphony's card game since we were discussing regular Polyphony's because you were curious, um, did it make the uh, top 100? It looks like it's no longer ranked. Then Ben went to gone.rado.com. Hey, go ahead and make that an actual link. Not that it matters. Uh, this doesn't matter at all. Why am I doing this? Just because I'm kind of obsessive. Gone.rado.com, but didn't see it there. I can't imagine uh, you got rid of it because of space issues. No, that's true. I still kept um, Polyphony's card game. It's fantastic. So, Ben's question is, would there be any way to link unrated games to Gone from the Gone.rado.com list and maybe indicate which games are unranked because you don't have a final copy? Uh, because that's often the case. Often... Uh, you've seen me watch a video, you wonder, how did I rank it? And I haven't ranked it yet because I've only played a prototype or something like that. Or because I got rid of the game and I got get rid of the ranking. Um, right. And so you're wondering, hey, because I've already had all this work done, could we do something? Well, the thing is, this is all driven... This is all driven by um, the Geek List on Rado... Or, uh, the Rado runs through Geek List on Board Game Geek. Which, again, I mean, what is that? Um, let's see... Did he make a link directly to the geek list? No, he didn't. But if we go over to... Let's come back to the browser one more time. Going back to Board Game Geek. For folks who don't know... Boy, it occurs to me, I should really make a shortcut to my super geek list. The RRT geek list. How many items are there? There are 1,796 games listed on this geek list, which is what all the games that I, and now others, have covered over the last decade. And so he is, re he is getting a... He is pulling from this list, because this is as close as you can get to a master list of every game I've covered, and then um, also, at the same time, pulling from my ratings, doing jiggery pokery and putting it all together. Um, which is why, if you go back to the list itself, gone.rado.com, you will find that, uh, you know, it's only the top 300 games, the ones that I've actually kept that I have rankings. Oops, what did I, just, I just went to gone. I meant to go to games.rado.com. It's only those top games that have rankings. Because that's, you know, and then, you know, once you get past that and you get to the other, what is it, you know, 1,400 games that are listed here. Is that really 1,400 games? Jeez, it doesn't seem like it, but I assume it is. Um, 
yeah, they, they don't have rankings because I haven't ranked them. Because I didn't keep the game, because I didn't like the game, because I've played only a prototype. There's any number of reasons. So here you're wondering then, I'm sorry, I'm just setting the stage for everybody else, because obviously Ben knows his way around this. Link unranked games to the gone dot, uh, to the gone dot raw list and maybe indicate which games are unranked because you don't have a final copy. That is interesting. So what you're saying is that he would also pull from gone.rado.com and you know, like maybe put an asterisk nest to it that says, oh, Rado got rid of it. And you can click here to read why he got rid of it. That is an interesting idea. Honestly, I think he should be able to do that. But the thing is, I do not want to ask him to do that. He has already done so much for me. Like I showed you that other list, the top and, and all of that. <sighs> if he ever comes to me and says, hey, do you want anything more? I think that's a fantastic idea, Ben. And I think he probably could pull that data and just put a little bit more. Because I think if you look closely... Is this right? Yeah, if you look closely, at first he just had the names, but then he went back and he put the dates on them as well so he could make top. So I know he could expand on this. I just don't want to, you know, take advantage of his kindness. But it's a great suggestion. And, uh, you know, if he ever volunteers, I will definitely talk to him about it because I think that's fantastic. But anyway, bonus question, Ben, ends with, what, well, what about Peloponnese card game? What's the deal? It has, um, it has to be, says Ben, one of the best space slash cost values in gaming. I completely agree with that. Here's the deal. Um, let's go back to the, to the Board Game Geek one more time. Or no, yeah, back to Board Game Geek. There is, right, okay, no, that's actually what I need to go is I need to go to ranked.rado.com, but then I, I don't think I've actually made a uh, shortcut for this either. So I need to filter from, uh, not board games I own, but board games I have not pre-owned or previously owned, but games I have pre-ordered and show me that list. And this is a list of every expansion I've got, like Aeon's In stuff, um, or every full game that I consider to be an expansion, like the the uh, Pandemic um, shoot offshoots, or the original version of Project Elite, because I've now got the new version of Project Elite, or um, Codenames Duet, which to me is 90% Codenames, with just a tiny little twist, that honestly, the original Codenames is better than Codename Duet. And so... I don't want my list of 300-some games to list a bunch of repeats saying, well, hey, here's Peloponnese at number 7, and here's Peloponnese the card game at number 7.5. To me, that's kind of meaningless. So I classify a lot of games like this that are considered full games. I, I consider them the expansions, and I, I'm assuming that Peloponnese, Pelo, is on this list. Yep, there it is. Now, here's the problem. I might be doing it a disservice that you have pointed this out because Peloponnese the card game is not just, you know, I mean, it, 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 has it changed the game enough to stand on its own in the list? I mean, and honestly, I don't know that it has because again, the auction is the same. The, the way you manipulate resources, how you store resources is really the fundamental thing that changed. Is that enough for me to actually list it separately on the list? I don't know that it is. And that's why I own it and if I were to rate it, I would, I'd would i probably rate it a little bit lower than Peloponnese because Peloponnese rating at being so high is in part because it's got so many expansions. And Peloponnese card game does not. But it would rate super duper high because it's almost as good as Peloponnese. In some ways, it's better. Here's the deal. If I ever get around to playing, I've, I've got uh, Peloponnese, the, expan or, um, the, the expansion for it. What's it called? Um... The card game expansion. I can't think of the name of it. I've got that. If I ever get a chance to play it, I will reevaluate this and see if Peloponnese does deserve to be called out. Is Glenmore on this list? No. Glenmore 2, I feel, changed Glenmore enough to warrant being on the list separately. So my main list has Glenmore and Glenmore 2. I don't know the Peloponnese changed the, the core DNA of the game as much as Glenmore did. I don't know. It's a sticky subject. I'm, I'm not even saying I'm particularly consistent about it, but that's kind of the thinking. And, um, you know, what is the status? The status is it's great. I really need to play the expansion. It's uh, And Pelephanes is one of the best, and Pelephanes card games is, I 100% agree, Ben, one of the best space-to-cost values in gaming by far. Okay, let's move on to Jake. Who notes that I've covered or, or asks, have I covered Caper Europe by Keymaster in any of my rundowns or playthroughs? It's a fantastic two-player game that Jake thinks Jen and I would really like. Came out in March of this year. No, I haven't. I don't know why. 
if and I can't, I, 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 I honestly can't even visualize the game. And if somebody tells me about a game and they ask, well, why haven't you played this? Why haven't you covered that? If I can't even think of it, chances are it's a three-player minimum game. Uh, and that means, oh, I saw a three-player and I just completely ignored it. Or I was able to look at it and dismiss it out of hand because of something. Caper Europe is, is I, I kind of feel like, isn't it a, uh, is it a deduction game? I think it is. Once again, folks, back to the browser. Let's go to Caper, Caper Europe. Let's take a looky loo. All righty. I don't have it uh, on my wish list. And it is, it is a tug of war area majority influence game. I saw that and said, here's the deal, Jake. Every game that I come across on Board Game Geek, I am looking for any reason I can to say, eh, that's probably not for me. Because there's literally hundreds of new games that get added to the database every month, and I need to have shortcuts to not have to spend an hour evaluating every single game on the off chance we might like it. So I am certain I took a look at this and uh, looked at the mechanisms that says, oh, it's a tug of war. Jen and I are not interested in that at all. It's an area majority influence game. Definitely not interested. And so I said... Okay, remove that from my brain. Do not need it anymore. And I'm sorry. And you know what? I could be totally wrong. I could be. Maybe it's absolutely fantastic. If Keymaster, the publisher, were ever to contact me and say, hey, we'd really love for you to cover the, the uh, game, then I would definitely go and read the rule book and, and find out if my gut response was right or wrong. Uh, and you know, this is not, I mean, heck, it's, it's doing really, it's got an 8.1, although that just means it doesn't have, I mean, that means it does not have enough voters yet, right? No, of course not. Because, uh, uh, yeah, overall, it's number 1296 in board game. Yeah, so that's, it's doing really well. I, I trust you. It's really great. And maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm making a mistake, and it would have been perfect for me and Jen. But you say tug of war. You say area control, area majority. And I'm like, I got a, I've got 50 other games out there that I know I'm going to love. I don't want to take a chance on one that Jen might not like. So that's the dealio with Caper Europe. Okay. Hey, Lance. Lance is curious if I've heard of the Spiel Foundation. I believe the Spiel is one of the OG uh, classic board game podcasts, is it not? You know, I mean, going back almost as long as Tom Vassell, maybe even longer. And if I recall correctly, I think one of them is in Portland, so it isn't even very far away from me. And apparently, yes, and you're right. I remember, yeah, every year they would do um, charity drives, and I, I, I'm assuming they still do. I have to admit, I stopped really following board game podcasts a couple of years ago. I do not have any board game podcasts. I used to have um, Dice Tower, um, and I used to, oh, uh, what's it? Uh, no pun included. Efka and John of John Gets Games used to do a podcast together that I really enjoyed. I used to listen to Shut Up and Sit Down. I used to listen to a bunch, but there's just no time. So I've ultimately unsubscribed. I only follow two podcasts now, The Ezra Klein Show and um, Forward. Those are the only two I actually subscribe to, and then occasionally I'll listen to a single episode of other ones. Um, so basically much more politics uh, and real-world issue-focused podcast listening. So anyway, uh, long story short, I feel like I've heard about it, but I'm just so far removed from board game podcast world, even though that's literally what I'm doing right now. Irony of ironies. But anyway, let's continue from Lance. They're a group that is always at board game con or board game conventions where uh, you pay to play a party game for their charity that sends board games to hospitals, kids, clubs, etc. That's fantastic. I, that is wonderful. And I'm pretty sure these are the guys that walk around in those meeple blazers, right? I'm pretty sure. I know I've met them years ago at Essen Spiel. And I, oh, it's driving me nuts. I don't remember their name. But anyway, Lance continues. They're also on Amazon Smile. So if you want something board game related to support through Amazon Smile, they might be the only thing. So this was obviously a thinly veiled ad for a very good cause. And Lance, I salute you. Folks, if you're listening to my podcast, you must like listening to Board Games Podcast. Can I suggest pointing your broadcast, your podcast listening device towards the spiel? Uh, a couple, you know, a couple of OGs, and my gosh, this is so amazing. The next time you are gonna go to a board game geek, you know, board game geek um um, the the one in uh, November or the, the one in spring, if you're there, maybe you want to sit down and join in. And uh, play a couple party games to put literal smiles um, on, uh, on on kids' faces and, and adults' faces who are stuck in hospitals. That's amazing. That is beautiful. I, I, I so respect them for doing this. And finally, 
If you're on Amazon Prime, if you're an Amazon Prime subscriber, folks, or actually, you don't even have to. If you ever buy anything from Amazon, this is just in general. Sorry, skipping away from board games. Folks, if you ever buy anything on Amazon, do not go to Amazon.com. Go to smile.amazon.com. Because if you buy via that means, a portion of the proceeds from that sale will go to a charity that you can choose. Jen and I, we have raised by now, I would imagine, hundreds, if not thousands of dollars over the last what, five years towards a, a particular dog uh, kennel charity that Jen really, really likes. Um, and you know, just buying the stuff we were going to buy anyway. And apparently, this is amazing. If you want to get board games in the hands of people who need them the most, who need that boost, you can, if you're going to buy something from Amazon.com, go to smile.amazon.com and uh, adjust it so uh, that that tiny fraction of the sale will go to the Spiel Foundation. That's amazing. I love it. And Lance, thank you uh, for bringing it up to everybody. Okay, let's move on. Paul works at Spielebox in Vienna, Austria. We're a board game library where customers can rent board games for up to 28 days. And since we're funded by the city of Vienna, it only costs 10 cents a day to play. We have over more than 8,000 different board games. We're definitely the biggest board game library in Austria when it comes to number of different games rental. We're pretty sure uh, we're the biggest board game rental in Europe. Are we, though? Maybe even the world? Continues Paul. My question is, is there a chance for a quick shout-out to all the listeners if they know of any board game rental with more than 8,000 different games? Okay, Paul, I think this is another. Like the previous one, Lance and Paul decided, but I don't mind. Hey, um, these are both cool things. That's just amazing. I am definitely, Paul, going... To, if I ever get back to um, Vienna... Um, have we been to Vienna? I, I, no, we have never been to Vienna. And so, someday, I will get to Vienna, Paul. And I will visit Spielbox. And I will pay 10 cents to play a game from your library of 8,000. That is amazing. But in the meantime, anybody listening to this, if you know of, uh, of, 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 of something that beats Spielbox, send it to questions at rao.com and I'll mention it in a subsequent episode of the podcast. Wow, that is amazing, though. My freaking hats off to Austria. Uh, or, no, I guess it's the city of Vienna. It's funded by Vienna. So it's not an Austrian, it's not a federal-level program. It's a city-level program. Still, that is amazing. Oh, man, that is great. Okay, uh, from Samuel. I just saw a thread, says Samuel, on Reddit, talking about how I, Rado, left the site because, quote... People were mean to you, end quote. And Sam was wondering what my side of the story is, if, if I don't mind sharing. I've uh, definitely, says, continue Sam, seen uh, some bad posters on Reddit, but overall, Sam thinks the moderators do a good job of keeping things on track. Maybe, maybe I might want to come back. Um, Sam cajoles me to come back. It is true. I used to post regularly on Reddit. I never posted my videos because there's that weird, all those weird rules. But yeah, I used to subscribe. I used to go to Reddit once a day and and check the oh what was it you know board game thread of the day and all that and and often you can get some really good you know cutting edge you know right up to the you know I mean often you will find out about stuff in the board game industry on the Reddit board game thread or forum faster than you will anywhere on Board Game Geek. And so I was always very impressed by it. And um. So I've never really talked about it, but my side of the story is, because here's the deal, folks. Um, I still have a Reddit account. I do still go there every once in a while, but not very often anymore. And I don't think I'd ever go back in an official capacity because um, while it's great, it's a wonderful resource. So many, and, and, and you are entirely right. This happened years ago when Reddit's board game geek or board game forum was a cesspit of negativity. It was just horrible. And I left... Tom Vassell left, some other people left, because it's just non-stop, wall-to-wall, people grousing about how terrible things are, and just never having a good, positive, upbeat thing to say. Because that's what it is. People were not mean to me. I did not leave because my feelings were hurt. Basically, if I recall correctly, it was a game that I had covered, 
and I went on Reddit because, oh, it, it was, it was uh, Clank in Space. When Clank in Space got released, it was a really big deal because Clank was already a big hit. Clank in Space was, you know, changing, and I thought it was fantastic. I really enjoyed it. I did a video for it, and then I went on and saw what people were talking about, and everybody was just like, everybody was ripping it apart. Everybody was just being dicks for dick's sake. You know, I mean, what happened to the, if you don't have something nice to say, don't say anything at all. What happened to, don't, um... Don't yikes my yum, or don't harsh mellow my harsh, or whatever. It's people just going on there for the sole purpose of saying, you're wrong, this is garbage, I don't care if you liked it, I don't care if you actually played it, it's crap, it doesn't deserve to exist. Um, actually, uh, what's it, uh, Eric Martin just did a really great editorial video about this the other day. People who just get online for no other reason than to just say, I disagree with the existence of this game. And Reddit was awash with that. And foolish me, in my Mission to Civilize, I thought I could wade in and say, look, I've actually played the game, and I'm a positive, upbeat individual. Let me kind of turn that frown upside down and explain to you what you're missing about why it's so cool. And it was just endless wave upon wave upon wave of, again, nobody being rude to me at all. Maybe there were some dicks, make no mistake. But for the most part, it was just wave upon wave upon... Nah, it's still garbage. Nah, I'm just here to hate board games. That is the only reason I come here, is just to... Uh, what is the yikes yum thing? I don't remember what it is, but anyway, you know what I mean. And I'm so, so I'm, I'm in the middle of this, and I'm in the middle of like three or four or five different response threads where I'm trying. Look, you don't understand. Here's what this game is. Here's why it's exciting. This is what is new and different. And just trying to be positive, trying to be upbeat, trying to be excited and freaking happy to play board games. <laughs> it's getting to me. It's starting to come back to me. And I realized halfway through this, what am I doing? Why am I here? What am I accomplishing? These people came on here for the sole intent purpose to be angry. No amount of positivity is going to change their attitude. No amount of direct hands-on knowledge is going to change their attitude. They are just here because this is fun for them. And I realized I am making myself. Nobody else was making me miserable. I was making myself miserable. And I realized I got to get out of here. This is bad for me. I am a positive, upbeat guy, and I am very, very sensitive to negativity. I just have no use for it. What is the point of being negative? If you want to be negative about something, just say, oh, let's forget about that and be positive about something else. Look at, look at me. I'm being negative about something. I'm being negative about Reddit. But anyway, so what happened is I had like these four or five threads that were going back and forth, and I, realized, and I had this epiphany. And so I just said, because I have had this long-standing thing that I don't just, I treat, um, what do you call it? Interactions online as if they're real. A real person is there in front of me. And um, so one thing I wouldn't do, if I were talking to you in real life, I wouldn't just like, uh, just turn around and walk away in the middle of a conversation. I would at least say, uh, okay, thanks. Um, it was nice talking to you, bye. Right? I would at least do that. And that's what I did. In those five or six little sub-threads, I just, I just wanted to get the heck out. I, I, I just like, I, this, this, you know, the clouds part, I realized I will be so much happier if I'm just not here. I need to get away as fast as I can. So uh, for all these, I just said, okay, bye. Because I realized I was beating my head against the wall for nothing. These people were never going to um, meet me halfway and try to see anything positive. All they wanted to do was bash and say, oh, this is just a, a cheap cash grab. You know, all that standard negativity. So I just said, okay, bye. Okay, bye. Okay, bye. I, I did that like four or five times. And as I understand it, that is now one of the biggest recurring memes on board game Reddit now. The people say, okay, bye, as a reference to the fact that Rado took his ball and went home because he was a pensulant child. When me, from my perspective, I was just acknowledging, hey, you know what? I don't want to talk about this anymore. So I'm just going to say, okay, bye. We're done talking. I'm just going to say goodbye. And then I went elsewhere and I posted it. Hey, everybody. I think I'm leaving the site because there's just too much negativity. Everybody ignored that, of course, and everybody misinterpreted it um, to say, oh, Rado had his feelings hurt. I did not. At no point did I ever have my feelings hurt. Instead, I had just had it up way past here with just endless, needless negativity. I just didn't need it in my life. And so I am much happier having never gone back. Now, I made a huge mistake. Because I had recently done the same thing with another forum. I was on a an invite only uh, board game developer forum, or not video game developer forum. Because of course I was a video game designer for twenty years, and so I was in this other one. It's called the Chaos Engine. You have to have an invite to get in. You have to prove you're a member of the industry. And I had just recently left that one permanently as well because it was starting to become a really Really, I was like, geez, Louise, if you people keep complaining about Anna Sarkeesian 
I just, I am done. I can't be a positive person here anymore. You're all so negative and so grousy. I'm leaving. And to force myself not to come back, because I was kind of addicted to that site. You can, we can get addicted to things that are bad for us, right? I deleted my account on the way out. So I literally couldn't get back in, right? Um, because it's an invite-only thing. And um, and so, oh, I was like, hey, I did that for Chaos Engine. I could do this for Reddit, too. And so I said goodbye. I deleted my account so I wouldn't come back. And here's the thing I didn't realize. I, it was a huge mistake, and I do regret it. That meant every post I'd ever made, and I'd made hundreds and hundreds of posts to Reddit in many, many threads, um, suddenly became listed as... I forget, uh, user deleted their account. And that was stupid. I shouldn't have done that. And I assume people didn't realize that I didn't know that was going to happen. I thought it would still say, Rotto runs through said this thing. I didn't realize that it was going to look like it did. And if I if I known I wouldn't have done that, I would have just changed the password and then lost, turned it into a random bunch of gobbledygook so I couldn't log anymore. That's what I should have done instead of delete it. So that made it look worse than what it was. But to this day, people are still saying, okay, bye, because it's a reference to what a what a jerk Rotto is, because he can't hang with the cool kids, I guess. I don't know. Um, but I can say, Sam, or Samuel, to your point, yes. At some point after that, the um, moderators on the Reddit Board Game Geek forum got much more hands-on with trying to tap down the more negative elements of the board. It's still there, but much less so than it used to be. So could I come back? Yes. Am I going to? No. No because I just don't have time. There's just not enough time in the day. I mean, here's... Let me show you why. Let me go back over to the browser one more time. We're still on Board Game Geek, right? Can you see up there at the top of the screen? I have 1,500 unread um, notes or uh, comments, threads to catch up on. I have a lifetime worth of stuff to read on Board Game Geek as it is. And if I'm not... If I don't have my finger on the pulse quite as much as I used to, I'm okay with that. Um, because Board Game Geek tries very, very hard to be a positive and upbeat place. And uh, yeah, so that's that's just a better fit for me. So that is what happened there. Thank you, Sam. Um, I, uh, for let me set the record straight. If there's anybody who listens to this is on Reddit, you can point them to this episode. Uh, to maybe, but it's fine. You know, uh, I mean, the fact that Board Game Geek or no, that Reddit board games has a subreddit devoted to, hey, here's us being toxic assholes, um, you know, because it's funny. I mean, th th you know, that's that just shows the underlying, the, the certain people are attracted to Reddit. They don't have us. They 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 do not find that they are as welcome on Board Game Geek, and so I'll just stick with Board Game Geek. It's fine. But um, I'm glad you're enjoying Reddit. I mean, again, it's a great uh, a great resource. Okay. Let's move on. TJ was wondering if I if if TJ could see statistics on how everyone if no if wait no yeah if wondering if I Rotto can see statistics on how everyone votes for the games that I cover every month. Uh, TJ uh, figures that I probably can't see or do not want to see what everybody votes for, but can I see uh, if there are people who vote? Oh my God, yes on everything or no on everything. Uh, TJ asked because it took TJ six months. To a year, it took quite a while for TJ to realize that if he voted, oh my god, yes, on everything, he negated his vote. <laughs> it is true. You were, um, you kind of canceled yourself out. I was wondering if I could tell you if there was anybody else uh, who used to make this mistake. I don't know. I'm sure you're not alone, TJ. I am sure you're not alone. And um, once again, let's go back to the browser for folks who are curious, what is TJ talking about? Because uh, this might be interesting for some folks. I will give you a bit of a tour behind the scenes because, um, let's see, if you support the show on Patreon, um, one of the benefits you get, even if you spend only $1 a month in supporting the show, you get to vote every month, folks, on what games I and uh, other members of the team will film in the following month. And you can see, here's a list of all the recent, um, what do you call it? all the, uh, I can't think of the word. Ballots I put out. Every month I put out a new ballot with a bunch of games and people vote on them if they are subscribing. Them. Um, and so, uh, for June, Dice Realms came in at number one with uh, 3,288 votes. Space Station Phoenix came in at number two with 2,590. You will note, 
I've already covered both of those games because they were the top of the list, so they were going to get covered. Simplicity came in at number three with 1937. I have not covered Simplicity, um, but it would be the next one I would cover. And then Great Western Trail, because I talked about how I could cover the solo. And then all the way down at the bottom, very, very sadly, Nirvana. Which is a shame, because, oh my gosh, Nirvana is such a really cool roll and write slash ladder climbing card game, where you literally roll and write to make your own cards to play a ladder climbing game. I do not understand why it's at negative 184. Anyway, though, every month people get to vote. And if you look a little bit more closely, you can see for each one of the games, it's not just a yes or no. They can vote, oh my god, yes, cool, okay, shrug, or no! And behind the scenes, what that means is if you are voting, um, oh my god, yes, that is five votes. If you vote no, that is negative five votes. And if I recall correctly, shrug is zero, okay is one vote, cool is three votes, and oh my god, yes, is five votes. Um, because, yeah, I don't actually have 3,000 people backing me on Patreon. Oh my gosh, I wish I did. But um, with the multipliers and all of that, because uh, you know that's why the, the vote numbers are so high. And it's a way for people to say if they're really excited about something or not. And here's the thing. If you go in here and say, oh my god, yes, to every single thing, then every single thing gets plus five points. And so you didn't really vote for anything. So here's the deal. Uh, let me just show you, uh, TJ. I can't see anything. I can create a new one. I give it a name. I, uh, you know, yeah, there's two types. It could be selection based, which is more of a traditional thing, but the level of interest is more fun. I can copy a previous one, which is why I do every month. I get the previous one. I delete things people had chosen, and then I add new things that are available to cover. And then I upload the emails because I have all these emails from people. I use these emails for nothing, unlike whatever merch store um, that Donna was talking about, these emails only exist so that I can email you your ballot, you go to a special page, which looks pretty much like this, and then you can vote. And interestingly, you can change your vote. After you've made your vote, if you're like, I think I like this one more, you can actually go and change it. You can rearrange it. Or if you look, oh, what I cared about isn't even important, but oh, the two that are really close, I'm going to go and um, vote for that one because I want. Uh, I didn't care about either of those, but I want that one more than the other one. So it's a really flexible system. I'm really, really keen on it. Thank you again to the developer who programmed it all for me um, all those years ago. It still working to this day. Uh, my legs hurt. I hope your legs don't hurt as much. Uh, that's the, uh, the uh, name of... Or not... The, the, I won't say the real... Uh, Jeff. Jeff. Thank you so much. I'm still using it to this day. As you know, it works so great. Um, so anyway, I have no idea. One th I have one problem with this. Occasionally, when I put a new thing in, I notice I made a mistake. And I do not have a way to edit these. And I've never wanted to pester him and ask him for more functionality. But there have been some times where I've made such a huge mistake. I'm like, okay, I really need to update this text. Because I literally am misleading the voters. And he says, okay, here's what you do. And he writes me this incredibly long Byzantine thing about um, my SQL queries and all kinds of stuff I've got to do. And so, in theory, if I went and I looked through all that stuff, I could probably get all the information, but I do not have any desire to become an SQL programmer. Um, is that right? Uh, MySQL, uh, SQL, I, I forget. I, I, something like that. Um, so yeah, if I asked, it's it, it, he'd probably only have it, but I, I've, I've never felt the need to use it. So I'm afraid I cannot answer your question, but I, I'm fairly confident, TJ, you're not alone. Okay, and that's it. We're going to move on shortly to Jen's gaming questions. I got a few from Daniel. But before we get to that, folks, I'm streaming this live here on June 14th, 2022. There is an audience of people who have been listening to me this far. And I'm going to pause for a second and see if they've got any questions they'd like to throw into the queue. And if not, we'll move on to Jen's stuff in just a minute. So let's see what we shall see. Okay, folks, we've got a few interesting questions. Let's get going. Um, first of all, we've got... Where was it? Dr. <laughs> Professor123, a uh, very uh, learned and erudite person, I'm sure, asks, um, would I do a uh, best board game geek features that you shouldn't miss video? That is a great idea. That is something I've thought about doing. A Rotto runs through Board Game Geek many times over the years. And I've always hesitated to do it because Board Game Geek is always in the process of changing things up and evolving. And I always feel like I should wait until it's done. And as time goes on, it's real. It's never going to be done. But let me, t let me uh, give you just a couple of things right now. Some things that I love about Board Game Geek, right? Let's go back 
to the browser and let's go back to Board Game Geek. Um, some cool little secrets. Well, okay. Uh, Board Game Geek, I think more than anything else, is a really, really great um, tool to find games that you might want to buy. That's certainly what brought me to the site in the first place. And at first, I used it very poorly to find information about to help. It, it can be an incredibly powerful tool to ensure you always get games you like, or it can lead you down the stray and you end up getting games you hate. So if there's one thing I want to talk about, how do you use Board Game Geek to find games that are perfect for you? There's one thing you have to know, folks. Create your Board Game Geek account, and then go to... Uh, let's see. I'm not used to it in this. Right. Where are forums? Go to forums, all forums, then go to, where is it? Recommendations. This recommendations form is by far the single most valuable thing here because post a thread, say, hi, everybody. I really like game blip, blop, and bloop. And the reason I like them is because of zippity and zoppity and zoo. What do you recommend? And I guarantee you will get 20 to 30 answers, all very good, very well considered, within a few days. And you'll have some research to do. And you could then follow up, well, I heard this game has this and that and the other. What do you think? This is a very popular hopping forum where people are always incredibly knowledgeable people who, like me, have played literally thousands of games and study everything. They are just waiting for you to show up. So, to ask a question, when I eventually discovered this in my first year of board gaming, I went from just getting crap game after crap game to getting games that we love to this day. So, um, so get to the recommendations form on Board Game Geek. But let's say you asked for a recommendation. Um, right, uh, like... Uh, what are right? No, this is a. Uh, 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 show me somebody ask a question about games. Best trader game. Jason um, asked best trader game. And actually, he had questions and he had people vote. Um, and then you know people actually gave him feedback and whatnot. And so maybe Jason says, well, somebody mentions the thing infection at Outpost Thirty One. I haven't heard of that. That wasn't on my list of ones I was considering. Maybe I should learn a little bit more about it. So. Step number two about Board Game Geek. When you are interested in, if you know there's a game you're interested in, yeah, you could check to see if there's a run-through by me. By far the best thing you can do, because if you watch my run-through, you'll know what it feels like to play, and hopefully you'll know whether it's a good fit for you. Don't worry about my final thoughts. Whether I like the game or not is immaterial. Whether you enjoyed the run-through, whether it seemed like the gameplay as demonstrated was fun, that's the important thing. But if I don't have a run-through, what should you do? Well... Uh, super secret thing about Board Game Geek number two. Go to the game. There's a lot of stuff. Ignore all of that. Up at the top, there are, for the thing, Invention at Outpost 31, there are 352 comments. Click on that. And what you will get is people rating it a 10. 106 people have rated it a 10 out of 10. 49 people have rated it a 4 out of 10. By far, the vast majority of people, 397, have rated it an 8 out of 10. Here's what you do. Start reading the people who are so in love with it and can't get enough of it. Read a few of those and see if there's anything that, oh, I like that. That is an interesting thing for me. Then, go to the other end, and you can just click down here. Go to the people who are rating it 5s. And, um, and make sure you have, um, you know, do ones that have comments. You have to turn... It'd be nice if it was have comments on by default, but you have to turn on has comments. And now, look at the people who hate this game, who can't stand it and think it's the biggest stinky piece of garbage ever. Read through that and see if you uh, if anything jumps out at you. Oh, yeah, that's not something I would like, is it? I don't know. Weigh those two things. What do people love about it? What do people hate about it? And then try to discern, well, what do I think? If you still need, then what you can do is you can go back to your thread and say, hey, I looked into this a little bit more and a lot of people are complaining about this. What do you think about that? That's it, folks. If you follow that simple one, two, three formula, because remember, I was step number two. Um, watch my run through if it's there. Or that was actually step number one. You shouldn't ever buy a bad game or a game that you will not enjoy. Use the hive mind of Board Game Geek. It's incredible. Uh, then there's so many other cool things. Like you uh, saw me earlier, I briefly went into the stats page. There are so many cool statsy things you can do once you have actually started. Um, you know, it is definitely worth taking the time to update your personal collection. Right? Um, because then it'll give you all these kind of stats about your collection. If you go one step further and actually keep track of how many times you play, it'll give you stats about what you played. And it'll tell you, hey, you haven't played this game in two years. Maybe you should give it a go because it's the hottest game on Board Game Geek. You know? <clears throat> so you've got all these things. These are really fun too. If you do a little bit of work. <clears throat> but that's like a 
That's like a Board Game Geek 105. Now, you know, that's like a later class. The most important thing, create your account, go to the recommendations form, which by the way, you can always get to. Yeah, go to faq.rado.com. And question number five is on my FAQ, because it's asked so often, I love game. What should I buy? And my answer is, go to the forum for recommendations. And it's a link directly there. Ask the question there. It's all but guaranteed that unless you're a jerk, if you, if you come here with you know positive, upbeat vibes and a, and, a, and a general level of excitement, you'll get better answers here than anywhere else on the internet about the best games to get. So if there was one thing I would say, and then a second thing, that's what I would uh, talk about for Board Game Geek. Excellent question. Okay, let's uh, move on to the next one. <clears throat> mm, where did it go? Where did it go? Where did it go? Uh, right. I see that uh, Adam, or Gadam Gray, asked, at what point do I remove a negative or zero scored game from the vote? Because uh, this is a follow-up. I showed how the voting works and all that, and people can literally say, no! Here's the deal. Every one of those games on that list have been sent to me by publishers. I am not going to get rid of any of them. I have over on a wall in the next room over, usually anywhere from 50 to 80 games waiting for me to cover. And if a publisher, if a publisher contacts me and I say, hey, that sounds really good. Yeah, I'd, I'd love to give it a try. I then feel honor bound to cover it in some form on the channel. If a publisher just sends me a game without ever talking to me, I do not feel obligated to do anything. I didn't ask for this. And if it's a game I don't like, boom, it just goes to the Dice Tower West convention library, which is what I do with all my games I get rid of. They just go to the library, and uh, hopefully uh, they'll, they'll find somebody to love them <coughs> down there. Um, so, the, uh, so if a game gets a zero or even less, it's not going away. You'll find it there on the next month, and hopefully it'll start getting some votes. But I do use that as a prior... I use that monthly vote as a prioritization scheme. Um, if... And uh, you know the things that kind of show up in the middle; those tend to be the things that my wife Jen and I will play in our monthly exclusive Rado R and R every month. If you're a uh, if you are a member of the show on YouTube, or if you back it on Patreon, or if uh, occasionally, very rarely, once a month, if you uh, subscribe on Twitch, you can watch a full run through of a game that Jen and I do that will never be public anywhere. Those are for people who actually support the show monetarily, and often those games will be the ones that aren't going to get enough votes for me to cover. But they're still ones that Jen and I really want to play. And so we'll play them. Some folks get to see them if they're supporters of the show. But then I will end up talking about them in the monthly Rotto um, Roundup. Which, by the way, I'm recording live next week on Tuesday the 21st at Twitch. Um, so, uh, and you know, and then if at that point it's obvious it's never going to get enough votes, the audience just doesn't does not want to see this, or they want to see other stuff more. But I have covered it in some form by making it in the roundup. I will then take it off the list. So that's basically that step two and three and four process for me. And there's variations of how that works, but that's the lion's share of how it works. Good question, Adam. Okay, <clears throat> next up, where was it? There was another... Oh, there are some for Jen as well. So we'll get to these questions uh, later on. And... Uh, oh, oh, right. Here we go. It was from... Uh, um, oops. Did I just push the wrong one? Yes, I just pushed the wrong one. I pushed the same one again. Let's try this again. Click that button. Click that button. Okay. <clears throat> This sometimes happens with featured dot chat, where featured dot chat just stops working, and it won't uh, disappear, and it won't come back, and it seems to be that has happened now. Let me refresh the page and see if I can fix that. Now, can I do the new one? There we go. There we go. So we have a new question from um, Eric F H M. What is my favorite elder god from the Cthulhu Mythos? I misread this because it was very tiny. I thought Eric FHM was asking, what is my favorite Cthulhu Mythos board game? I do not care about the Elder Gods themselves. I could care less about any of them. They are of no interest to me whatsoever. I will answer... I'm sorry, Eric. I will answer the question I thought you were asking. What is my favorite Elder Gods game? I believe 
off the top of my head. I mean, um, Arkham Horror, the card game, is fantastic. I, ca I could have imagined another world if I weren't doing Rado Runs Through. I probably could have gone deep down the rabbit hole and gotten all the expansions for it and kept playing it with Jen and going through campaigns. Because she liked it too, even though she doesn't like scary horror stuff. And it's just so well done. But I would have to say probably the best one I've ever played is... What is the title of it? It is... It's from Gray Fox Games. I remember the publisher... It is... Oh, and that's going to drive me nuts. i got to go look it up now. All righty. So, let's go back to that browser one more time. I need to go... Here's another handy thing, folks. You can um, you can click on search on the top of any page, but if you click on that and then click on advanced search, you will go to an incredibly powerful tool. I've gone to advanced search. I am doing a gray, er, gray fox. All righty, Gray Fox Games, thank you. I don't care about expansions, and I could narrow it down to a year. I could um, narrow it down to the number of players. I could narrow it down to a rating, to how heavy it is. I could really get incredibly specific, but this is going to be good enough. Uh, Gray Fox Games, no expansions, and, and then I'll just sort it by... I mean, it's not Champion of Midgard. It's going to be on this list, though, if I'm remembering correctly. Where is it? Oh, I could have... Yeah, there it is. London Dread. London Dread is a phenomenal game. Uh, I don't have it anymore because Jen and I actually played through the entire story campaign. And even though it has tons of replay value, um, I was looking for games that... Because I had to move from Malta back to the States, I had to get rid of like a third of my collection. And since we'd already finished the storyline for this, I felt like, what are the chances we're going to play it again? So I didn't keep it. But man... It is so good. You can go watch my run-through of it. I believe it's a run-through I actually filmed with Jen, if you want to see her live uh, playing with me. And um, it is a cthulhu -E ish type thing set in Victorian England, and it's fantastic. I really like it quite a bit. It's maybe a bit of a stretch, because it doesn't really wear its Cthulhu really strongly on its sleeve, but it's there. It's there. Um, right, so I'll go with that one. Although, I mean, the, the pandemic one, uh, Call of Cthulhu, I think, that was very good, too. I didn't keep it because I like other pandemics better, but it was also very nice. Okay, next up, what have we got? Actually, I think that might have been the last one, because then the other ones were for Jen as well. Yes, I think so. So, folks, we've done it. We've gotten through the game questions and a few bonuses from the live audience. And now, if you hang on, we will be right back with the love of my life, Jen. Okay, everybody, it's a few more games questions now that Jen is here. That's Hello. a picture of her. That's the real her. That's oh. Uh, oh. Or maybe it's just a rubber hand. Yep, that's <laughs> a, it's a prop gag I got. Um, and an AI voice subroutine that uh, is just programmed. She, she doesn't exist. Clearly not. Nope. But you'll never just have has. To, you know, never has. You'll just have to make do with what we've got, folks. Um, so. Um, Daniel, honey, had three questions. I don't know if you can answer all of them, but let's give it a go. When, when you get really hyped about a game, and you see that one mechanism that makes you want to go, Why? Why? What are those mechanisms? Uh, apart from a game not being too player friendly. So, basically, what would you say? Oh, boy, I mean, if I had it on the table, and he's like, I really want to play that. And then I say, oh, but it does what? It does X. And you're like, oh, no! What would that X be that you wish they didn't do? Just not being uh, being being mean to each other. Okay. That that is, is that a mechanism, or is that just a game style? Uh, that's more of a game style. Is there a particular mechanism that you can think of? And it's okay if you don't. I mean, I, I didn't actually do this Tell me what a mechanism is. A mechanism, is, worker placement is a mechanism. Oh. Um, card drafting is a mechanism. Pick up and deliver is a mechanism. Hmm. Um, eh. Tug of war is a mechanism. Have we played tug of war? Well, I'd be a thing where there's just a thing, and I'm trying to pull it over to my side. You're trying to pull it over your side. Okay. Um, I don't think I care quite so much about mechanisms. Okay. Um, I guess pick up and deliver is probably my least favorite kind of thing to do. Yeah. But um, sometimes it's fun, so it's not an immediate. <coughs> Why? Why? Well, yeah, pick up and deliver is definitely one that gives me pause, as does any kind of, you know, aggressive player versus player stuff. Um, uh, Jen is forgetting. I don't think you're particularly engaged, or maybe you are. Maybe it's mostly just me. I've kind of lost interest in board game puzzles. Oh, yeah. The escape room things. Yeah. Yeah. And it's really too bad because those are so much fun, but 
they've had to make them so obscure, the mm. clues or whatever, that it seems like mm. in order to make them not hard, they have to make us feel stupid. Yep. Also, I I don't know. I I, th- I think I'm a little tired of uh, deduction stuff. Mm. Oh, I've got this and this and this. And okay, I know you have this one thing. So this other thing must be one of these other three things. I mean, and it's fine. And there's lots of different forms of that. Where it's, you so know, you're not talking about deduction like the Sherlock Holmes. Well, kinds that's, of games. that is Sherlock Holmes. Sherlock Holmes deduces stuff. By, well, I know that's why my mind instantly went to that. But yeah, yeah, you were, but no, I mean, you were saying deduction something about games this are. Are they, they do that same kind of thing? Uh, not not necessarily a a, mis- a murder mystery solve. I don't mean that, but rather, okay, I've got these three pieces of information, and I know that thing over there is one of two possible things, and because of that, I can deduce mm. that this thing over there is the thing I want, and that thing over there is the thing you want, and what should I do? Kind of thing. Yeah. I mean, there's nothing wrong with it. I just I've just kind of gotten where. Uh, yeah, can I just have more open information, please? I just, I, I'm just kind of, I, 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 we used to, I mean, Alchemist and Search for Planet X was very cool, but I'm just mm. not as engaged by that as I used to be. Yeah. Um, I wonder if we're also just not getting older. <laughs> because We are getting older. I, I noticed around the time I turned 50 and not, you know, like on the day or whatever, but that it was just harder for me to retain um, like three different things in my mind that, mm-hmm. okay, well, I've added up this potential path and it's going to cost me 69 mm-hmm. and I've added up this potential pass and then it's going to cost me 63. Mm-hmm. And then I have to add up this other one over here, which ends up being 73. And then I can't remember what the 69 was. <laughs> and then I have to go back up and add up the 69 again. Mm-hmm. So I think that there is something, and I've talked to a couple of my girlfriends who are my age and they're saying, yep, happens to us too. So I don't know if it's just part of, you know, sort of an aging process that you can't quite keep as much information sharp in your mind as you used to. Okay. And so that could be another reason we're not, like, jiving on the deduction stuff. Yeah, I, I guess maybe. I mean, just in general, I'm not interested in memory. You've never been interested I've in memory. I've never liked it. I've always, you know, that's a big one for me. I don't know how you feel about that. No, I, I think what I'm saying is exactly that. The, it's it's are... hard for me to remember. And that's why I use cheaters now with putting things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You do that I a lot I put markers now. now on things that where I know it's completed. So yeah. I just don't have to try and remember what yeah. I was going to do over there. Okay. So is that lazy? Are we just getting lazy or is it just our brains are getting older? We find different things fun now. Okay. Related, vice versa question. Do you remember any games where you saw something really, really cool, but it was a war game or a three-plus player game or something you dismissed? You're like, oh, oh yeah, that happens all the time. Yeah. Jen, of course, has no idea because she doesn't know any game other than what I put on the table in front of her. Yeah, I've played a couple games at conventions, though, where I thought, oh, that's really cool, but it's too bad it's just kind of a boring game. Yeah. Because I like, I like glass. Anything with glass in it or marbles kind of rolling marbles that kind of stuff um but generally they are constrained by the rolling of the marbles and so there's only so much you can do with that yep um yeah i mean uh, if i if i do a search what the heck let's do it let's go to the browser what the heck let's go to a minimum players three player minimum specifically and uh, no, we don't care about expansions. Show us everything you got, Board Game Geek. Three player minimum games. And then tell us the best ones. All right. Uh, uh, yeah, ne- I love negotiation games. I don't think Jen cares for it, but you can't negotiate in a two player game. It's just pointless mm-hmm. uh, because of the zero sum nature. So, right off the bat, Twilight Imperium is obviously it's all about negotiation with other players. And I really enjoy that. Um, and. Uh, Let's see, what else jumps out at you? Or party games in general. I mean, just one is a very, very cool game. Um, Yeah, actually, I played that with my family at Thanksgiving like three years ago, the last time we were together at Thanksgiving. Yep, and again, not something that's going to be good for us as a two-player game. Uh, Let's see. Oh, and uh, a lot of older auction games like Modern Art or Almond Ray uh, that are classics for a reason or for sale that, uh, you know, hey, won't work. They they couldn't be bothered to make them work for two players. So, I mean, that happens all the time. There are tons of games that we can't play because of our two-player limit that uh, we think are great. So, yeah, that's not at all uncommon. So, we're already in the 300 and you've only gone down. So, give me just the top 100 that they are saying. Well, I mean, you won't. I don't think you'll know any of these. Well, no, I mean, there's only like five. Okay. Decrypto, which is another one of those deduction-y type things, uh, mm-hmm. or reverse induction, I don't know. Two versions of Twilight Imperium, Battlestar Galactica, which is a hidden traitor type thing, and Puerto Rico, which it never should have been a three-player game because it works great as a two-player game. Yeah, so the okay. only one I know on there is actually Puerto Rico. Yep. 
Okay. Last one. Uh, game related question. Are there, and this is the one I thought you might, I'm not, I'm not quite sure what you're going to say. Are there any classes that you gravitate towards in game? That's kind of like role playing game classes, like the healer. Oh, yeah. Or the support class. Yeah, of or course. the glass cannon, you know, the wizard who does a lot of damage but is incredibly weak and needs to be protected. Or the berserker or the, you know, the, the, the meat shield or, you know, I mean, you're familiar with yeah. all these kind of things from different games. So what do you gravitate towards, honey? I tend to gravitate towards being an archer. Okay. Yeah, like a ranger. Um, and I like being a druid in EverQuest. Mm -hmm. so, Why? Because uh, you can stand back. You don't have to be right up there in the fray of it. But you're also not the healer. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that, that's what I tend to gravitate towards. I tend to gravitate towards uh, being a healer support class. That's always kind of my natural predilection. I got nothing against being on the front lines. So, but you're saying you don't want to be on the front lines either, but you don't want to be a boring old crappy cleric. Nobody <laughs> wants to do that. Who, who, who cares about other people's hit points? I just want to hit the thing, but well, not on the front line. Yeah, I'd like to stand back a little bit. And Why? Because then you don't get hit. <laughs> <laughs> and you just don't want to have to worry about it? Yeah, it's just less to think about. All right. Well, there you go. So, that was it. Just a few quick game questions. And now we are done with the gaming portion, folks. Once and for all. And if you don't care about the personal stuff, then now's your cue to skidoo. And we'll say thanks for uh, listening or watching. Have a nice day. Talk to you there so long. Bye-bye. Don't forget to send more questions to questionsaround.com. But if you're not done, if you'd like to peel back the curtain on me and Jen, then hang on. We'll be right back with the personal stuff. All right, folks, maybe you just skipped right to this. Maybe you don't care about that game stuff. And you just want to hear what Jen and I have to say about the world. So let's start with Andrew, who asks, what? What? Or no, I'm sorry. One of Andrew's three new chickens doesn't seem uh -oh. to be laying eggs. Oh, dear. They're, they've been in the coop for four weeks. The other two are, re are laying regularly. Any tricks to get the third one going? Oh, well, are they all the same kind of chicken? The same breed? Because that can make a big difference. Some of the chickens don't start laying as early as others do. Mm -hmm. So I think all you can do is wait. I don't believe there's anything you can actually do other than making sure, of course, that they've got good food and water and, and feel safe and are unstressed. And if they're the same breed? Well, even so. there's you know, every, Individuals have variation. Well, I mean, does if the one's not laying, does that mean... I mean, he didn't say how old they were. Maybe one's significantly younger than the others. Or, I mean, can one be molting while the other ones aren't? Or uh, Well, they're new chickens. Yeah. Um, in, in theory, they're young chickens, is what he's really meant to say. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Hard to know. And if the other two are laying daily... I mean, if you have different um, breeds of chickens, then obviously they lay different colored eggs. So you would be able to tell who is laying what. And so that's probably why you know that the other two are laying daily. Um, which also makes me think that you've got young chickens because... Well, he didn't say, and you're really focused on that. So let's cheat a little bit, folks, and skip ahead to the end because there are pictures of these chickens. Oh! A spoiler alert in the dog section. Oh, good. Um, yeah, there's Scout, a four-month-old mini Australian shepherd with the chickens. So you can see they're just all reds. Yeah. Huh. Well, I don't know. I would be interested if maybe the dark red one is the one that isn't laying. And maybe she's got more Rhode Island in her than the other two, or who knows what. I, um, these are probably the hybrid chickens, and they were developed by uh, the government, actually, to have a very high-producing egg-laying chicken. Mm -hmm. And so they are a, a, a combination, usually, of Rhode Island red and, um, push. I used to know, something else. Um, so it's, it's possible that maybe the genetics of it is, one of them has a little bit more or less of one particular kind of chicken. Okay. Well, I'm sorry. As, I don't know. And as far as you know, there are no... Here's what you do. Here's the pill to give them to yeah. induce egg laying. Like tickle them with a magic wand or something. Uh, I mean, but there... I mean, have you ever searched for it? Is I mean, should should Andrew just not go to backyardchicken.com and ask? He could. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, everybody wants their chickens to lay as soon as possible. And I think the only thing that you can do about that is, again, make sure they're not stressed. Make sure they're happy and safe and are getting good food and water. Okie doke. Daniel asks, do we still wear masks in closed spaces? And related to that, is the pandemic over in our opinion? Mm. Well, I just had a doctor's appointment and had to wear a mask. Mm -hmm. um, uh, well, yeah. I mean, of course, uh, any place where you're required to, you're going to do it. But 
obviously, that's mm -hmm. a given. I'm sure Daniel's more wondering, do we do it where it's optional? Yeah, I think um, I, I am still carrying a mask around in my purse. So I guess the answer to that would be if I felt it was necessary, I would put it on. Mm -hmm. Under what circumstances would you feel it was necessary? Oh, like if somebody was talking really close to me or something, mm -hmm. or I knew I was going to be in a position where I was going to be talking very closely to people. Okay. Maybe something like that. Um, yeah, I'm trying to think, what, what what have we done in the last few months? Well, that's the thing. We don't actually, we don't find ourselves in closed spaces with strangers. We just don't. I go to the local Quickie Mart relatively regularly to pick stuff up. And that's, you know, like a double size 7-Eleven. And uh, there's usually three or four people in there. But I, yeah, when I'm standing in line, I, I, I still stay away from people. Yeah, I still, I still social distance, yeah. Yeah. Um, I've, I've never, I have not been in a situation where I've had to say, could you just please back up a bit? Um, but if somebody is riding up on me, I'll try to, okay, I'm just going to scooch over here to the side and get out of their line of breathing. Mm. So I'm, I'm kind of cognizant of that. But no, I don't wear a mask unless I'm in a medical facility or something like that where it is required. Um, you know, both Jen and I are double vaxxed and double boosted. Yep. Uh, so we've, and we'll, we'll take another booster right now if they'll let us. So we take that very seriously. Yep. So we're prepared. But um, yeah, and neither of us have gotten COVID. We have both completely dodged it. And uh, yeah, I stay the hell away from people wherever possible. <laughs> I definitely don't, ah, this stupid plexiglass thing. Let me move it out of the way. So or let me go around the plexiglass thing so I can really talk to you behind the counter. I uh, I avail myself of plexiglass wherever possible. And Yeah, actually, I'm thinking about it. And I have friends that I hug now mm -hmm. without masks and stuff. So, yeah. um, and, you know, it's not like a friend has any kind of protection no. against it. Yep. So that leads to Daniel's following question. Do you believe the pandemic is over? And obviously the answer is no. No, it's not. Thousands of people are still dying needlessly all the freaking time, every day. Well, and I mean, and things are spiking all the time too. Did you, have what? you told anybody about our experience recently with the hospital and the beds situation? Oh, uh, well, I mean, I you know my mom was in the hospital for a while and uh, yeah, we there were two different hospitals my mom has recently had to go to and uh, in both cases, they are so overloaded with COVID patients, the majority of whom are unvaccinated because we are in Southern Washington, which is a very conservative area compared to the rest of Washington state. Uh, and yeah, so the, the two of the hospitals that are local are completely overrun. And so my mom had to just, and everybody else were spending hours sitting out in the, in the waiting rooms because there were no beds available. Yep. And that's still happening. And it doesn't need to be. It just doesn't because there are still, what is it now? 30% of Americans refuse because they believe the lie they've been fed over and over and over again. And it's just so painful. It's even more painful when you've got somebody who really needs medical attention exactly. and she can't get it. And she's out there wheezing and just yeah. barely hanging on in the waiting room. Yeah, the reality is this pandemic will never be over because of humanity's insistence on doing, or a certain portion of humanity's insistence on refusing to accept proven science uh, because it's an identity for them that, oh, I'm going to own the libs. Man, I'm sorry, I don't want to... But anyway, yeah, that's the reality of it. Uh, what is that? Last I knew, 30% of, you know, uh, you know, a sizable portion of Americans simply refuse because they believe that it is a stand or it is their personal freedom. When in fact, all they're doing is hurting themselves and people that they are near. Uh, they're trying to, I mean, and I don't know. I mean, do these people believe they should be allowed to drink and drive? Well, I'm not hurting anybody until somebody dies. So in the meantime, why can't I drink and drive? Why, you know, I mean, why, why shouldn't I get a, vac a vaccination so that, you know, regardless of you, so that you won't kill other people? Or, I mean, and people always forget, too. It's, it's so binary. Either I survive COVID and I'm fine or I die. Yeah. And in fact, no. There's a, lot. There's a huge spectrum between those two yep. where your lungs will be permanently scarred for the rest of your life because you refuse to take a vaccine that was in the most safe thing you will do. That It's safer than driving a car. It's safer than riding in a car. It's safer than crossing the street. It's safer than anything. And you refuse to do it and therefore you open up yourself and your loved ones to permanently scarred bodies because of this. And, and nobody ever talks about that. And the news, the media only ever talks about, oh, deaths are up or down. You know, what about people who will never be able to take a full breath again for the rest of their life? What yep. about them? Ah, anyway, no, the pandemic is far from over. But Jen and I are both, you know, we stay the hell away from people wherever possible. And um, we only, I mean, you know, all of Jen's friends are also double vaxxed and double boosted. 
Um, yeah, I think they yeah, are. Yeah. yeah. And so... I know one person who wasn't, mm -hmm. and she had medical reasons for not being yeah. vaccinated. Yeah, and fair enough. For people who have medical reasons, I've got nothing but sympathy for them because I'm sure those people want to. I mean, probably more so than most. Those medical reasons yeah. make them very much want to. And so it's even worse that people who can do it refuse to do it because they believe lies Blatant, blatant lies. Well, and then the medical profession has has to still treat people. Yeah, it's yeah, it's all very after they've been spat in the face upon. Yes. So anyway, no, the pandemic is not over. Question number two from Daniel: What are your thoughts on the Johnny Depp winning defamation suit, justice for the victims, or abuse, uh, or a step back? I didn't pay much attention. From what I know, it's all very unfortunate. He was a total jerk. I I've. I saw some stuff where he was threatening to kill her and saying, I want to bleep, I, I want to set her on fire and then bleep the, you know, just horrible, horrible stuff. Terrible, terrible stuff. And maybe she did terrible stuff too. I don't know. I don't care. The whole thing was a media circus. It should not have been blown out of proportion. We should have all just turned our back because there's nothing good that comes out of that. Um, I... Uh, I, I think there's a definite double standard that was at play there that was very unfortunate. Uh, and also a double standard, even in your very question, because you said Johnny won. She won too. She also won against him and his legal representation that she was also unfairly um, maligned and all that. So the whole thing was very ugly. And our society, it would be a strong indicator of the health and well being of our society if we had all just said, this is gross. Change the channel. Yeah. That, yeah. Which is what I did. Because it was all of it gross. All right. Woo. Uh, Darren uh, <laughs> thinks the idea of marriage is silly. Because uh, Darren thinks it's mm. foolish to choose your life partner when you're 20 and expect to still be together at 60. Statistically, not going to happen for various reasons. So with that in mind, Darren's question is... <laughs> If Jen and I do live forever, do you think we'll still be together in a thousand years? Ten thousand years? A million years? A million. Well, don't forget, Jen opted out. Jen said, I had a, a 999 and 364 and 23 hours and 59 minutes. I want to drop over, I want to keel over dead. I believe that was your line. You wanted to die at a thousand. Well, or I wanted to make a new decision when better information That was not the option available to you. I, well, you know what? <laughs> Folks, this is science uh, is going to move your, forward. If, if this is your first uh, podcast, this has been a recurring thing for the last few months that I had mentioned that hey, I fully plan on living forever because if I can make it to a hundred, there will be I mean there will be breakthroughs. It's a oh by the time I'm a hundred, which is what uh, forty years from now, there will have been breakthroughs done that will say oh um, you know 150 is the new hundred. And then if I can make it to 150, by then our, we will have cracked the genetic code and everybody will be rolled back to where you can live for all of eternity, provided you don't get a you know, some kind of fatal wreck. accident, yeah. um, as if you were, you were 28 years old. That is the reality. That is the future of humanity. And then it becomes an option for people if they want to live forever. And so... And I've, I've talked about this before. This is going to happen. There's no two ways about it. There is no reason that our bodies have to age. Um, they've already made all kinds of breakthroughs. They've basically made immortal mice now who don't age anymore. And it's just a matter of time before all that is applied to us. First in the Western world and then across the world. And then everything about human society changes, of course. And um, so that led people asking, well, so what? Are you really comfortable? I mean, when do you want to die? And somebody said... Um, do you want to live forever? Or if not, what is the time you want to die? And it was a very binary, simple yes or no. And Jen said, I think about a thousand. I said, no, I won't, I won't live forever. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to get bored. Um, and so anyway, this is a follow-up. So Okay, but first of all, I would like to, to talk about his statement. Yes. Oh, what about the about marriage being silly in the 20 and the 60 and all that? Yeah. So actually, my mom had a really interesting take on this. Okay. And, I, and I thought that was really good. Well, first of all, let's just roll back because people used to live to be maybe 50 or 60. Sure. So it used to be reasonable to be married to one person mm, for your whole life. That's a good point. Right? Okay. So that's for starters. The second thing, and this is where my mom comes in, is she said, what if our society was structured in such a way where you um, you made contracts with with people. And so if you're in your childbearing years and you want to have kids, you meet somebody who also wants to have kids and you guys sign a contract with each other to be together for 20 years or 25 years or, you know, some appropriate amount of time for your childbearing, child raising years. Mm -hmm. And then at the end of that time period, you would say, okay, well now I want to go on to my travel phase or whatever. And if your partner would didn't, you know, you, you weren't 
in for that adventure together, you your your contract period is over. I mean, you've supported yourselves. You've done what you said you wanted to do. You've raised the children. You've mm-hmm. supported each other during that whole process. Um, yeah, and then you just move on to whatever's next. And that seemed to make a lot of sense to me because you you would maybe choose somebody for being in your childbearing years that would be different from say your 20s or say your 60s mm-hmm. or your 70s or mm-hmm. whatever. And I just thought that was a really interesting thought exercise of how we as a society might construct that. And of course it happens anyway because people get divorced and move on and, and find a new life partner. But what if we came into this open eyes with expectations of what our relationship was going to be and agreed upon before we actually have children or whatever the, the, the event is that you're planning for? But what um, about love? What about romance? Aren't you just sapping everything that makes life worth living out? I'm saying that hypothetically. Yeah. As a... Well, we've been married for a long time. Yes. I don't think I love you any less than I did 20 years ago or, or right, really anymore. Right, but if we signed a contract instead of getting married... Yeah, well, no, it would be a marital create... contract for those years. Yeah, but doesn't that create a different sense of expectations um, and all of that? Yeah, it there does. Were... That's the whole point. Mm-hmm. Different set of expectations. Well, what what, what about? Does that mean the humanity loses its spark? I'm just, I'm, I mean, I'm perfectly fine with it, but I'm just trying to articulate. Hmm. Yeah. I, I don't know. I think actually it might be better to make choices based on, I mean, we buy a car based on what our needs are. We Mm -hmm. buy houses based on what our needs are. Mm -hmm. We're not buying a spouse, but why wouldn't we make decisions based on what the current focus is? I mean, you even you accept a job offer or not based on if it fits in with your current plans. Mm-hmm. And we're not set up to do that romantically or societally, but why not? Uh, and there's no reason to say you couldn't Hallmark, stay together. Uh, greeting card that uh, ideal of romance. Yeah, well, you know, it doesn't happen with I mean, princesses and princes in castles either mm-hmm. these days. Hmm. I don't know. Okay. Um, so anyway, but I love you. I love you too. Okay. Do you think we'll be together in a thousand years? That's an interesting question. That is why Darren asked. Um, well, or will you've had enough by then or will you take two or 300 years off? <laughs> well, if you've got two or 300 years, you know, if you've got a thousand years, you could, why wouldn't you? You'd go off to one of us would live in Mars. I wouldn't want to live in Mars, but you might want to. <laughs> so wh- why would I want to restrict you from what you want to do just because we're married? Mm-hmm. Because you love me and you want to be around me. Yeah, but, you know, virtual reality and Skype and whatever. That's a good point. Virtual reality and Skype and whatever. Uh, I mean, it, you know, uh, 200 years from now, virtual reality will be really indistinguishable from real life physical interactions. Yep. So as far as raising children and stuff, yeah, you still have to be there and you still obviously have to have um, biological specimens. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, things have to mix and mingle, so to speak. Mm-hmm. So um, that still has to happen, but... Happen in a petri dish, that doesn't. Yes, but somebody has to be there to actually be feeding these children and raising them and teaching them and socializing them and all yeah, of that. I, yeah, I can take care of all that. You gonna? I, I don't want kids. Oh, I thought you said I can. No, you said AI. AI. Mm-hmm. Well, or more to the point, I think, uh, you know, in this future world, obviously, child bear, uh, human society will shift to where. Having a child is not just something that people naturally assume they're going to do. Yeah. Because everybody's living forever. Yeah, well, and we're already switching to that anyway. Yeah. That's yeah. definitely... I mean, the, the people living for everything, actually, I think... I don't want to go into spoilers, but... <laughs> um, what's it? Have uh, you a crystal the good, ball? The Good Place is a TV show about the afterlife. It's a comedy about the afterlife, and it digs really deep in all kinds of philosophical questions. And the final season of the show really goes deep on, well, okay... One of the things about the afterlife is eternity. How does that work? And, you know, here, practically, how does that work? And the characters have to wrestle with that. Yeah. um, Because they're in the good place. Again, don't want to spoil anything about the show. Everybody knows it was a show about the afterlife called The Good Place and the comedy that ensues. And, yeah, that final season, a big part, uh, was really, I thought, handled very well and very deftly. And I think probably very reflective of what humanity will have to come around to. And change its attitudes about certain mores. Hmm. All right. Forest of glass. Whoops, so I don't think we actually answered his question. Yeah, well, we'll be still together in a thousand years, ten thousand years, a million years. 
I think we will certainly be in each other's lives, whether we are physically together at all times. Mm-hmm. I don't know. Okay. That's a long time. Yep. And I like to ride horses and you don't. Nope. You know, I like to go to garden centers and you don't. I mean, we're not together all the time anyway now. And that was actually something that we struggled with early in our marriage, wasn't it? Because I wanted you to go to fabric stores and Mm -hmm. garden centers and stuff with me, and you had no interest. Nope. So. And I made that clear. And you made that clear. And I respected it, right? Mm -hmm. And we've moved on and everything, and that's fine. I don't know why that idea cannot be expanded out to um, everything. Mm Mm-hmm. Especially over a thousand years. Mm-hmm. That's a lot of garden centers. You yeah, have to certainly go to. nobody thinks to themselves, I moved out of my parents' house. Oh no, it was such an important, inf- uh, you know, impactful relationship. But nobody thinks twice about, well, yeah, I'm, I still have a relationship with my parents. Yeah. I see them a few times a year. And I still love them and they're still important to me and I'm important to them. We're part of each other's lives. I, see, you know, I mean... After a thousand years, why can't a marriage? I mean, why why shouldn't there be a more flexible view of that? Yeah, I agree. Yeah, I mean, like I said, I mean, uh, we we've got we've definitely gone through stages. Uh, early on, you had a certain ideal of how things should be, and you've come to adapt. And I mean, heck, the one we're dealing with the most right now is Jen. In her middle age, has become a voracious snorer. Oh. It's really, really bad. And we have tried everything. We have tried pillows that automatically detect her snoring and tilt her head so she will stop. I have tried noise-canceling earbuds. We've tried all kinds of stuff. And And you've been sleeping with earplugs for a long time. Yeah, and I've been sleeping with earplugs for years already. Uh, And so it's gotten to the point where sometimes it's so bad, I just have to go and sleep in the other room, which really sucks. And both of us are like, oh my God, this is terrible. You know, is this the death of our relationship? And we're like... Is it? It's, it's unfortunate. I mean, but pragmatically, it doesn't yeah. change the fact we that we still love each other. just bought a king size bed. Yeah, I know. <laughs> We've never had a king size bed, and we just thought, well, hey, let's try that because we've got dogs that are pretty, um, you know, expansive. Yeah. And we thought, oh, that'd be nice. And we have a room that would fit it and everything. And so, but I would say, yeah, you probably spent a third of our king size bedtime sleeping uh, in the other room. Yeah, and I'm not happy about it, but I have to sleep. And Jen has just gotten so bad. And, and I have to sleep. You've seen sleep apnea people. Yeah. You've, we've done everything. It's just. Her palate is collapsing, and sometimes, no matter how she sleeps, on her back, on her side, what on her face, it doesn't matter. <laughs> face sometimes sleeping. it's it's so bad that you can literally hear it from the other side of the house. Uh, and and okay, it's impossible for me to sleep, no matter what. And I could either make her miserable by constantly, honey pie, yeah. you're doing it again. Yep. So either she suffers or I suffer, and or I go sleep in the other room. And you know that was that's an adjustment. Yep. And uh, right now I need my sleep. <laughs> menopause yeah 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 yeah. i'm so, sorry but it's so yeah you are we're we're making a change because of that but hopefully yeah i mean you know and you said in our, in our 20s oh you know what sometimes you sleep in di- in different rooms in your 50s and you're like that's never gonna happen to us <laughs> yeah. but it's just pragmatism and so what kind of pragmatic choices would we make at ten thousand years whatever makes sense but yeah. i don't see myself stopping loving her or wanting her to be in my life or yeah. you know being a partner in life exactly yep yep me too okay Forest of Glass asks, for Jen and Richard. I like your name. When we travel, do we factor in climate change? Uh, ethical tourism, volunteering locally to help the environment and community. Uh, Forest of Glass uh, is a, is very active in volunteerism and does not travel much. Cool. Well, I, I commend you, and I think that's awesome. Mm-hmm. Um, to be fair, we don't travel much either. We have not really had a vacation that wasn't work-related for years. Um, yeah, I guess I used to go to England, but that was usually to work. That was work related too. Yeah, uh, you you use. I mean, oh hey, I'm I'm here, I'm working, I'm doing all this stuff in your original studio, and you know it was kind of an excuse to be able to travel, but it was still work related. I mean, I don't know how many years it's been since we did that um, Aegean Sea trip. Well, that was on our twentieth, twentieth or twenty fifth uh, anniversary. Yeah, I don't know, a long time ago. So we're actually having our first one uh, in the. In, Longer than we can remember, uh, <laughs> in the first week of July, we're going up to Alaska with Jen's sister and her husband and her kids. Uh, they had rented a mobile home, and Jen has wanted to live in a, on the road in a mobile home for 20 years now. And so, hey, we'll come up too. We will also rent one, and we'll caravan together for a week. So we're going to try it. And we'll see how it goes. And we'll see how it goes. Yep. Uh, um, and they, so. They've done a lot of RVing, so we thought that'd be a nice... <laughs> yeah. We basically we've got our RV guides. And to Forrest's question, uh yeah, we will fly up there 
and we will spend a week driving around in just about the most gas guzzling thing you can imagine. Yeah. So to answer your question, I mean, in this case, we are not really focusing on it at all. I know early in our lives, we really focused on, you know, doing, um, what do you call them? The, the carbon offset stuff. Mm -hmm. I used to do that. I used to, uh, but we haven't done that for a long time. I think in large part because we just stopped traveling. Plus, we also kind of give ourselves a pass because we don't have kids and never will have kids. So we have not exponentially increased the overall footprint of humanity through our actions. In fact, compared to most people, we are just a tiny sliver. Plus the fact that we, I mean, we drive a Prius. We, and we would have gone full electric if we could have. We um, tend not to run the heater or the air conditioner. <laughs> yeah. We just bundle up or, or strip down. We do a lot of stuff. But we just don't travel very much, and we hate traveling, and so we're we're not taking on additional considerations to to be more ethically minded, which honestly we should be. But we don't travel very much in the first place, and it's miserable when we do. Yeah. So we're just we. It's a choice we're making. It's not the best choice. We also should go vegan. We know that, but we're not doing it. Hmm. So it's a fair question, unless you have anything more to add about it. Um, I would like to add that actually my ideal of travel would be to get a little camper van mm -hmm. and be going through Europe and just enjoying that yeah. a slow pace, you know, not high mileage or anything, just really being where we are. Yep. That's been Jen's dream for easily 20 years. Yep. All right. So, so we're doing that's a the test kind of run. the travel that I want to do. Yeah. I don't want to be flying all over the world. Yeah. Okay. Kind of a thing. Goblin 981 says, I know you're an atheist, but uh, as a fiction, do you have a favorite God or religion? <laughs> So who's your favorite um, um, mythology? What's your favorite pantheon? Do you like the Greeks? Do you like the Romans? Do you like the Norse? Do you like the Hindu? Do you like the Shinto? Do you like the Native American? Do you mm. do you like the, the the Christian, the Catholic, I like the Buddha. Jewish? I you like, like Buddha. Yeah. You like Buddhism? Yeah. That's a... Uh, I mean, mostly you just like Buddha and what it represents. I'm sure there's yeah. a pantheon there be, beyond just the Buddha himself. Uh, yeah, I think there were... Um, yeah, there were other supportive yep. cast. But. It's funny you said fiction, but I'm gonna say faction. That's your favorite religious faction, Buddhism. Yeah. All right, and for yeah, because your mom was a Buddhist. Yep. Yep. Uh, you know, practicing. You know, went to, but we we drove her all over the place to Buddhist temples and whatnot. Yep. And yep. Yep. All right. Yeah. And I like I I do like quite a lot of what Buddhism stands for. Okay. Yeah. I don't think that's what God, God was going for, you know, like in, in the big yeah, matchup. Yeah, Thor or something. Thor versus Ares, God of, you know, that kind of, God of Thunder versus God of War type thing. I was going to say, I like, um... You like Chris Hemsworth. Six million dollar woman. You like... Jamie. Yeah? I'm just... Jamie Summers? Yeah, as, as a who, you know, let's just have a superhuman person doing great things. Okay. All right. Um... She could have been God. I, I suppose so. Or, or something. Demi God, perhaps. Yeah. Uh... I mean, obviously, I'm just going to say Norse mythology because of Marvel Comics. Okay. Because they decided right off the bat, hey, we're going to make a lead character, one of our lead superheroes, be uh, Thor, the God of Thunder. Yeah. Why not? Because we could. I mean, they could. I mean, and they they offered. There's no copyright on. on that. <laughs> I, I think it was. I think it was available in the '60s. I think <laughs> they made a good call there. Yep. Um, so I'll go with that, but mostly just because I love Marvel Comics. Next up from Goblin, what useless skill do you have? Oh, useless. Useless. Totally useless. Oh, I think good. my entire professional career is one long exercise in useless skills. I make video games, and now I make videos about board games. Uh, when the apocalypse comes, and they're trying to say who gets to stay in the camp, and they're trying to make pragmatic decisions based on who can do what, I know how to design games is not going to get me very far. No, but your people skills will keep maybe, you around. Maybe. You'll just start talking to them, and they can't get rid of you. <laughs> Um, a useless skill. I don't know. I, I can do the uh, Vulcan salute. Um, I can do. I can do this. Wow, Jen can do a crazy animated one. I can't like get it's my a hand in the right spot, but you saw yep, it. Yep, I saw it. Um, I think they saw it. Oh, too. I can touch my nose with my tongue. Okay. My tongue to my nose. Can you? Yeah. Are you not out of practice? You're not too uh, Did old. Did they want to see it? No. Yeah. I mean, you, I'll, oh. I'll, I'll. I will confirm. You did it. She did it, folks. Um, let's see. Can I, oh, can That's I still? something I found out when I was a kid. Let's let me see. just say. All right. Along those lines, can I still clasp my hands behind my back? Mm. Let's see. I haven't done it for a while. Oh, oh, they're close. Oh, close. Oh, the fingers are touching. Oh my God. I can't. Maybe if I was, oh, wow. Oh, oh no. I just got a major cramp. 
I used to be able to do that. Yeah, he I totally used to do used this. Skill. You know the yeah, they they they'd be like this, and I could just kind of pull them together. I I, I can I do it if I'm, I'm no. Okay, I'm just gonna say I don't have that skill anymore, particularly because I just really cramped up my arm in a huge way. <laughs> oh, no. oh my gosh! So no, I have no useless skills. The one useless skill I have, I've lost. <laughs> I'm even more useless. Oh, no. Uh, oh. no, I mean what? Oh, yeah, what's totally useless I can do? I, I cannot touch my. I'm gonna stick with the the yeah, tongue yeah. to the That's nose. That's pretty useless, That's... and you proved you could do it, and I proved I could not do my thing. Um, oh, I can raise one eyebrow. Do I do it? Yeah. Yep. That I, I can raise one eyebrow, not the other one, just the left one. So I can do that on command. That's probably a Leonard McCoy thing that you picked up as I a kid. I don't know why. Um, I remember doing it a lot as a kid. My brother, he could cross his eyes and I could do that. And so we'd both just sit at the table and stare at dad. And I'd raise my eyebrow and he would cross his eyes and just crack dad up. <laughs> and we would just do it and just make him laugh uncontrollably. All righty. Nick says, hope your mom makes a full recovery. It's been incur I've been encouraging everyone since my mom's passing to please talk with all their loved ones about a resuscitation, life support, and the power of attorney. It doesn't matter if you're healthy or not, young or old, discuss it with everyone and get in writing so when time comes, everyone knows the plan. It's hard enough dealing with losing a parent, wife. You shouldn't be fighting with your other family members during that incredibly hard time too. It's not a question, but I, I can certainly confirm, Nick, that is very good advice. I completely agree. It doesn't take very long, um, you know, do I mean, Jen and I, we had our first wills done when we were in our 20s. And then we updated them when we moved back to the States four years ago. Today, today, four yes, years ago is the day we today. moved back to the States. And we did not update our wills four years ago, but we once we got back and we were helping my mom with hers, we updated ours too. And, you know, all the, the DNR um, clarification, all that kind of stuff. So I completely agree, Nick. It's very good advice. Everybody yeah. make that happen. But also, you never know. You never know. And you just said, hey, we should probably do a bio gift um, arrangement. Yes. Because we've always thought, oh, we'll just give our body yeah. to science or, you know, let them take the don't the owner. But that doesn't just that happen they... on its own. There's a great organization called BioGift. I believe the website is BioGift.org. I will check. Um, you know, when my dad was, yeah, it's BioGift.org. When my dad was dying, uh, what was it, seven or eight years ago now, I guess, something like that. Uh, we were trying to decide what we were going to do and you know how expensive a funeral was going to be and, and the body department was like, so ridiculous. And I said, well, no. Does, does dad want that? No. Does dad want to give his body to science? Yes. Okay, let's do that. And so I found BioGift. They're one of many companies that do this. Um, and uh, you know, we signed up for them. We signed up my mom at the same time. And when my dad did pass, they were there within two or three hours and took care of everything. And, um, you know, don't know what happened. Don't know if his eyes went to somebody. Don't know if um, he was used as a medical cadaver. Who knows? But really good to know just in general that we are of use. And then the the, the parts of the body that did not have a use uh, were cremated and sent back. So, yeah. and all free of charge. And yeah, it was amazing. So my mom has signed up with that. And Jen and I were just talking about, we really should sign ourselves up for that too. Yeah, get it done. Yeah, get because you never know. You sorted. Never know. Yep. Okay, and uh, yeah, and then you just got that number, uh, you know, in your wallet, in your phone, contacts list, whatever. And I, I, I've been carrying that number for years for my mom. Okay, that was a bit heavy, um, but now let's go to something lighter. At the end of the month, it was a short list, folks. Send those questions. The questions are all.com. Jen has some words of wisdom. Ah, yes, I found this today on Facebook. <laughs> all right, stumbled across it from the tinybuddha.com. Oh, there you go. Look at that. Yep. Um, and it is sometimes you just need to talk about something. Not to get sympathy or help, but just to kill its power by allowing the truth of things to hit the air. Okay. And I find that really helpful. Mm, why is that? Oh, because otherwise it's, it sits around and stews in your head and it gets worse and there's no perspective on it at all. Sometimes even just saying something out loud, you go, what? Did I just say that? Mm -hmm. That is ridiculous. Why have I been thinking about this for a mm -hmm. week? And I just said it out loud and I can actually now see what a ridiculous thing that is. All right. So yeah, I think I think it's very good, and of course, if you have somebody you can talk to, um, who yeah. will just listen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's definitely. I mean, yeah, that's a, it's a kind of a comedy trope you see a lot that women stop solving my problems. I just want to talk and have a sympathetic ear. But you know, it's a trope based on reality, and it's something I had to learn over time. Is that sometimes Jen doesn't want a solution to her problem; she just wants me to. She just wants a sympathetic ear yep. to talk about her problem. I'm like, okay. One of the many things we've learned in our uh, 
Your marriage is going to take us to 10,000. <laughs> yes. Okay. And then finally, some dogs. You've already seen one of them because yeah. we cheated. Andrew with his picture of Scout, a four month old mini Australian Shepherd with oh, chickens. You were that. looking at the chickens before. There's Scout. Yeah, if I see Scout. Do you Scout. think Scout is uh, maybe one of the chickens is being terrorized by Scout? Well, this is interesting because Scout's definitely on a leash or tied, tied down. But, you know, they are prey animals. So having a predator, a wolf. From yeah. their perspective, a wolf that wants to kill them, right there. And he's definitely energetically in, engaged yeah. with them. So, so you think that might be stressful them? And that might have an impact on one of the chickens because of their psychology? Could be. Could be. Yeah. Chickens respond to stress and they'll stop laying eggs in stressful times. Yes, they will. Yeah. Scout, you scamp. All righty. And then Nigel, once again, brings us some oh, Charlie. Oh, Charlie. Uh, Charlie at the beach. Sky at the beach. She's beautiful. And I was a bit disappointed. Charlie again. I was going to expect it's Charlie and Sky, but it's just Charlie doing uh, loping along like the adorable Charlie that he is. Oh, that's lovely. Yep. Excellent pictures. Thank you, as always, Nigel. Yay! And uh, thanks, everybody, once again, for all your questions. This is definitely a shorter episode than most, so we definitely need more questions. The questions at rotto.com. And thanks, as always, for supporting the show. Hope you enjoyed it. Talk to everybody. So long. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.